What's up, y'all? Alvin here, and today is Question and Answer Episode 9. I'm going to run out of fingers. <laughs> I tell the good jokes. <laughs> All right, so once again, got a ton of questions. I'm just gonna jump right into it. We'll start off with the YouTube questions. First up is Dominic Nonnenmacher, and Dominic wants to know, if you're stressed out, what's the first thing you try to do to relieve that stress? Doesn't have to be fly fishing related. <laughs> I've been practicing my mindfulness meditation so when i get stressed out the first thing i try to do is just take a few deep breaths and clear my mind and that usually tends to work um, if it's really bad i maybe go sit in a quiet room uh you know like 10 or 15 minutes and usually i'm good <laughs> thanks for the question i think that is an important subject everybody needs to figure out a way to relax to kill that stress so yeah, thanks for asking that. And hopefully that helps somebody out there. Um, next up is uh, Keep It Simple. Keep It Simple wants to know, do you provide equipment for guided trips? And what happens if something happens to the gear? Also, what is the most important thing you try to provide as a guide on your trips? For example, catching more fish, entertainment, knowledge, etc. <laughs> okay, so on the equipment, I do, and most of the guides I know, provide all the equipment for the trips. You know, we just wanna make sure you got the best gear for that particular day of fishing. Um, you know, if something gets broken, most of the time it's an accident. Uh, most of the gear nowadays has a lifetime warranty, so you're just out the cost of shipping it back. The worst thing sometimes is just the weight. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag between when you send it and when you get it back. You know, it's just kind of the cost of doing business. Accidents happen, we have the gear, we usually have multiple backups, so it's really not that big of a deal. I have had clients offer to pay for the repairs, usually I decline, you know, tips are good to cover that. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, no big deal. Uh, on that second part of your question, uh, as far as what do I think is most important, really it's whatever the client for that day's trip wants to achieve you know do they want to catch fish do they want to learn something uh do they just want to take a boat ride and swap some jokes and uh, <laughs> some entertaining stories you know so it's kind of a day-by-day -day thing um now as far as guaranteeing you're going to catch fish or you're going to catch a lot of fish or you're going to catch big fish i don't think any guide's going to do that or consider that as an essential part of a good trip we try our best, but you know, that old saying is true. That's why they call it fishing, not catching. Nobody can guarantee you fish. If they do, I want to know what their secrets are. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the question. All right, uh, Rafael Zamudio. Raphael, I know I screwed up your last name. Sorry about that. <laughs> but anyway, Raphael wants to know what's a good entry level vice. Spending around 400 bucks seems a little bit excessive. Yeah, that is that is quite a bit of money. I don't know of any entry level vices. I have an expensive vice that I got almost 20 years ago, uh, and I'm still time flies with that. So. If it seems like something that you're gonna to wanna to do long-term, you might wanna go ahead and spring for the more expensive vice, uh, guaranteed it'll last longer. Now, having said that, I do still have my first super cheap vice that I got 20 plus years ago. <laughs> I don't tie with it, but it still works. It hasn't fallen apart. If you have a friend, maybe somebody's got a, an older vice that you can borrow, just kind of tie a few flies, see if it's something that you really want to do long term. But I think in the long run, if you do get into fly tying and you enjoy fly tying, it's probably not a bad thing to pony up for that nice vice. Anyway, good luck out there. Thanks for the question. All right, so uh, Brian Smith wants to know, what states have I caught fish in 
And have I ever removed a hook from myself or somebody else that's gone in past the barb? <laughs> the first one's a pretty easy question. Uh, I think I've fished all the Western states with the exception of Arizona and Nevada. And I haven't fished hardly any of the Eastern states with the exception of Florida. So I'm hoping to get out and explore a little bit more in the Eastern part of the country. I know there's a lot of great fishing out there, but there's a ton of great fishing out West and that's a little bit closer to where I live. On that second question, the uh, hook question, I have actually retrieved a few hooks from people, extracted hooks, I guess is probably a better word than retrieved. One guy in particular, I have de-hooked him twice on the river and both times it was past the barb. Trout hooks, so it was pretty easy. I use the old trick where you wrap a piece of mono around it and yank back. Um, a little blood, not much pain, but uh, it, it definitely is a good technique to know. If you haven't heard of that technique, uh, look it up online. I'm sure there's plenty of examples out there. It's probably better to start mashing those barbs down on your hooks if you're hooking people left and right. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the question. Uh, Luke McCloyd wants to know, have you ever used furled leaders and what do you think about them? I personally have not ever used them. I have seen people use them. The people that use them uh, really love them. I know a couple people that actually make their own. So there's definitely a time and a place for them, but I just don't know enough about them to give you much advice. Thanks for the question though. All right, let's jump over to Twitter and answer a couple of questions over there. First up is Mark Allen. And Mark wants to know, do you use the same fly line for redfish in cold weather and warm weather? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, cold weather in Texas is uh, usually not real cold. There are definitely days where if you go out there with your mono core line, you're gonna have to do a little bit of stretching to get the memory out. But typically I don't fish a ton on really cold days. So my warm water line works just fine. I have tried a few cold water lines, but the problem is, is swapping them back and forth seems to be more of a hassle than just using one line the whole time. Anyway, thanks for the question. Uh, Chase Rogers has got a question and he wants to know what's the deal with game changers and other jointed patterns, especially for bass. I don't know. Sometimes they do seem to catch more fish and other times it seems like it doesn't matter. They are fun to throw and they are cool to watch in the water. I think it's just another tool to have. Um, some days, like I said, that's all they'll eat is a game changer. Other days they could care less. Some days they'll eat a clouser when they won't eat a game changer. <laughs> so just gotta have a little bit of everything. <laughs> anyway, Chase, thanks for the question. Jeff. Barkley wants to know, what is your all-time favorite species to fish and what would be your ultimate bucket list trip? Man, I get this question a lot and believe it or not, my answer is probably a redfish. <laughs> I mean, you know, or even a bass on a popper during the right time of year. Uh, one of those two fish, I'm happy catching my local fish. I could fish in Texas for the rest of my life and be completely happy. Bucket list trip, I don't know. There's there's a lot of places I would like to go, but I really don't feel like there's anywhere that I just have to go. I have been fortunate enough to travel around a fair amount and fish some cool spots. You know, last year, my last big trip was to the Seychelles to fish for GTs. I caught a rooster fish in Mexico the end of last year, and I would do any of those trips again. You know, I'd like to go to New Zealand and stalk some of those super spooky trout, but the reality is, I'm just happy going fishing on my home waters. Anytime I can get out and fish, I'm stoked. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Sorry I don't have anything more exciting on my bucket list, but man, you know, just every day is exciting to me. <laughs> All right, let's answer some of these Instagram questions. Once again, you guys are just so awesome to ask me all these questions. I'm not gonna be able to answer them all, but let's, let's try a few of them. Some interesting questions. Paddling Fly Guy wants to know, have you ever come fishing in Europe? And, and I have not. Um, I don't know much about fishing in Europe. If you got some destination that I need to check out, let me know. Maybe I'll put it on the list. Maybe I'll get there. <laughs> Thanks for the question. 
Okay, uh, J.W. Crawford has asked this question at least twice that I know of, so he really needs the answer. <laughs> and it is, what fly lines do you use? Like what brands, uh, what tapers, whatever. And I honestly, I'm not super, super nerdy about my fly lines. I use a lot of Orvis lines and I use a lot of scientific anglers lines just because I've used those lines for a long time. They seem to have plenty of different tapers to do what I need to do. And uh, like I said, if the fly line works, I don't really worry too much about it. You can really get deep in the weeds with that. And I got so many other things I'm worrying about. <laughs> Not worrying about, just thinking about. But yeah, Scientific Anglers, Orvis, those are the ones I use. Bass tapers, saltwater tapers, redfish tapers, you know, nothing fancy. Usually have at least one or two sink tips, mostly for freshwater, for the bass fishing. Don't use a lot of full sinking lines. And uh, yeah, yeah, I try to keep it simple as possible. But thanks for the question. People wanna know. <laughs> Okay, so Real Montana wants to know how many guide days do I do in a season and how did COVID affect that? I have no idea nowadays. I know for years on end, I was doing, you know, at least 200 days a year, 250, sometimes more. I mean, I would never turn down a trip. I mean, for years. <laughs> I love doing this, so working seven days a week was no big deal to me. I'm still kind of that way. I'm always doing something every day of the week that probably a lot of people would consider work. People would consider doing these videos work, and I do this every day. I wake up in the morning and uh, I'm ready to go. So yeah, who knows? Definitely not doing that many these days, you know, maybe 150, maybe 200, but I'd have to check the calendar and get back with you. Now, COVID has an unbelievable effect on our entire business, not just me, but the rest of the guides that work for All Water Guides. Once people realized being outdoors and outdoor activities were one of the safer things you could do, I mean, business was just through the roof. We, we couldn't keep up with the demand. Most of the guides were doing as many trips as they wanted, and some of them were doing more than they wanted. <laughs> Things seem to have calmed down a little bit, but yeah, we're still pretty busy. You know, we're really fortunate. Uh, I know that that was not the case for a lot of businesses. And uh, yeah, we really, uh, we really do consider ourselves lucky to be doing what we're doing. Thanks for the question. <laughs> All right, so Jay Burke wants to know, is there a secret to avoiding bass thumb? Now, the one surefire way to avoid bass thumb is to just not catch any. <laughs> Some days that is not a problem, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I guess you could uh, get some fishing gloves, um, maybe one of those little finger sock things, Band-Aid, uh, one of the surgical things to protect your finger if you got a cut on it. But uh, typically bass thumb is something to brag about. I see so many pictures of people posting their ragged thumbs at the end of the day of pulling a bunch of bass out. So uh, yeah, usually bass thumb is something to be proud of. But if it's bothering you, the easiest way is to just stop catching them. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> All right, uh, KWF294 wants to know if I ever use a popper dropper rig and under what circumstances do I use it? I don't typically use them very often. Uh, my wife loves using them and um, you know, she catches tons of fish that way. I don't know. I guess the circumstances I use the popper dropper rig in are when I'm fishing with my wife and she's catching a bunch of fish on the popper dropper and I'm not catching fish on what I'm using, then I'll switch over. <laughs> it is a great technique. Maybe not the most beginner friendly technique because usually you're throwing a pretty good size streamer hanging beneath the popper and it's a little bit tough to cast, can tangle, and you also have to be careful when you're casting in close to brush that you don't get your dropper hung up. But uh, it definitely is an effective technique and it's one I should probably use more. Thanks for the question. All right, uh, like I said, tons of questions. I guess we're definitely gonna have to do episode 10 because <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, but one more, 
And that one is from Baba Goes Outside. The question is, what trend in the fly fishing world are you most excited about? I'm most excited about the fact that more people are getting into the sport. We definitely need more people in the sport. We need more diversity. We need more people of color. We need more women in the sport. We need more young people in the sport because if this sport's gonna continue to grow and expand and continue to just get better, we need more people. And I know that's sort of a double-edged sword. Yeah, there's gonna be more people out on the water. Um, I'm gonna have to work harder to find a place where there's nobody else. The flip side is, is there's gonna be more people that are gonna be concerned about our waterways, concerned about taking care of these places we fish. And you know, that is not a bad thing. And I do feel like there's plenty of good times, plenty of good fishing to go around for everybody that wants to get involved. So that is the trend that I am most excited about is just more people getting into the sport, growing the sport and helping the sport be better. All right, so that's it for this week. If you have questions, please uh, throw them in the comments. I'll try to answer some down there. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. <laughs> I'll see you in the next one. And in the meantime, good luck on the water.